Good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron Dorfman, and I'm a pediatric cardiologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I'm going to, go to talk to you today about cardiac imaging in Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome is a highly variable congenic, congenital condition uh, born with a typical karyotype of 45 XO, although there is a wide variation, including a number of mosaic karyotypes that can all uh, have the similar function um, as the classic karyotype of 45 XO. Typical incidence is about one in 2,500 live born females and is very highly variable, both based on the mosaic karyotype, as well as even within a specific karyotype, we see a huge variation in which clinical findings are seen, both in the heart and in the other findings as well. There's a wide range in what we see from a cardiac standpoint. Most commonly, we see a bicuspid aortic valve or corrotation of the aorta. There are certainly a whole range ranging from very mild findings in the aorta, such as the elongation of the thoracic aorta that is shown here to very significant aortic and left-sided abnormalities such as like hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and then a number of systemic and pulmonary venous abnormalities as well. From a study from the NIH, which looked at a whole wide range of abnormalities associated with Turner syndrome, this does show the typical expectation that bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation are the most common. And then a number of other things is seen as well, including a higher incidence than we initially expected for pulmonary venous abnormalities. And for all individuals with Turner syndrome, I typically quote about a 50% chance of having some type of cardiac abnormality. Over time, the thing that we follow the most closely is the dilation of the aorta. And this is most typically the ascending aorta, which differs from those with other connective tissue diseases where it's often the aortic root. So this is typically the ascending aorta, but can be anywhere along the aortic arch, uh, including the transverse and descending aorta, as well as the head and neck vessels uh, in addition. The trick with Turner syndrome is trying to identify what is the right size for that ascending aorta, given the fact that individuals with Turner syndrome are typically smaller um, than the general population. And so the question is, how big is too big based on the patient's age and body size, given that those may not fit the typical societal norms. So in adults or any greater than 15 years of age, we typically will index to body surface area for the aortic size index. And then for those individuals that are less than 15 years of age, we will use an, a specific Turner syndrome Z-score calculator. Uh, the website is seen there. And often I'll just search for a Turner syndrome Z-score calculator if it's a computer that I don't have it pre-bookmarked on. Um, and you can just plug in uh, height, weight, and aortic size, and then it spits out your Turner specific Z-scores for those smaller kids. What to do with those numbers is then based on the guidelines from the 2016 meeting that were published in 2018 and 2019 looking at um, the recommendations across not only the heart, but the rest of uh, the body as well. These were published simultaneously in the European Society of Endocrinology, as well as the statement from the AHA in circulation. And those uh, articles are seen there. So for, at the time of diagnosis for cardiac screening, we usually recommend blood pressure in all four extremities, an EKG, and then detailed imaging of the heart, which is typically echo at diagnosis and then discussion of when the most appropriate time for cross-sectional imaging, such as an MRI or CAT scan. For echo, this is certainly easy. It's something that we every cardiologist and pediatric cardiologist we have in our office, they're quick. You can do it at this time of the appointment. There's no sedation or radiation, and you have results same day. Disadvantages, echo can be more challenging to see structures surrounding the heart. As you get bigger, it's more difficult to see through soft tissue and other types of artifacts. And in little kids, they move around. And so there are some limitations on being able to see what you want to see by echo. On the other side, MRI gives us gorgeous three-dimensional pictures that you can spin around and look in any plane. Um, and there's no radiation associated with this. You get beautiful uh, imaging of structures outside the heart, like the aorta and the veins. However, the disadvantage of the MRI, it's not available in the office. It can often be very difficult to schedule. Um, they can be more costly than echocardiogram. They may last for an hour to two hours to get all of these images. And in the younger kids, they may need sedation to be able to lay still in a tube for that period of time. Certainly something that is quite useful in the imaging, uh, but not something that can be done on a regular basis, certainly not in children. And so the recommendation for imaging in Turner syndrome um, is an echo at diagnosis, uh, I would say in all individuals. Um, and then for kids, we typically follow them by echo through childhood. If there's something that I can't see by echo, then we would certainly think about an MRI sooner. And if we can see things clearly by echo, 
then we would plan for an MRI when they're old enough to get it without sedation, which is typically ages 12 to 14. There is some variation in that. There's some very mature kids that can be done sooner. And there's some kids that even at 16 or 18 are not yet ready for the MRI and may still need a little bit of sedation. But I will always make sure that we get an MRI before age 16 or so, even if that does mean sedating them uh, likely. For teens and adults, it's usually an echo, echo and MRI diagnosis. In some cases, if you have beautiful echo images, you can get an echo at the first visit and then an MRI at the second. But if there's any questions or concerns, I would always get both forms of imaging. And then the frequency of follow-up is based on patient age, size of the aorta, and the other, other abnormalities or findings. And there's guidelines based on all of these things, both for the younger kids, as well as based on the older uh, individuals, uh, teens and young adults, for both frequency of imaging, and re restrictions on any types of activities. And this is all based uh, on those two um, guideline papers. And so when should you do something about the aorta? And we could certainly talk at length about this as well. But for younger patients, a Turner-specific Z-score greater than four would be a recommendation to think about a surgical procedure. And for those with a greater than Turner-specific Z-score greater than three, we think about more aggressive medical intervention. And then for older teens and adults, an aortic size index of two and a half is generally considered high risk um, for subsequent dissection. And there's additional data recently that, su that suggests thinking about where that best cutoff would be, and it's something that will certainly evolve as time goes on. So I thank everybody for your time, and if there's any questions, feel free to reach out. Take care.